Hello again, everybody. Hello. Thank you, not only for having me here, thank you to the Council on Aging and the Friends of the Library and the uh, Carlisle Library for having me here, but thank you for coming. Because I know that you could be getting ready for Halloween and trick-or-treating, or you could be at the Boston Red Sox celebration parade. So I am personally very honored that you have chosen to be here today. Um, today we're going to be having our second lecture of two on religions of the East. And as you recall, in our first lecture last week, we talked at length about Hinduism. And I just want to recap some of the uh, big ideas about Hinduism. We talked about the, uh, the supreme deity without any attributes, Brahman, that underlies all other deities and other manifestations in the world. We talked about the Upanishads, these philosophic uh, dialogues that are uh, very ancient in the Hindu tradition and that the kernel of wisdom that they are all getting at, in my opinion, is formulae, uh, uh, formulaically represented by two different sayings. One is Atman Brahman. Atman meaning self, Brahman being the supreme deity, that you are the supreme deity. You are the supreme deity. The other way of formulating this is Tat Vam Asi, thou art that, thou, you, are that, that which cannot be named or understood, the supreme deity, Brahma, thou art that. I thought, uh, since Angela encouraged me to bring in some of my books uh, last time, uh, we have four books that I've authored um, here, and one is called Naked Zen. It has ten essays on Zen Buddhism and one uh, uh, extra essay on Hinduism. <coughs> we have Chrysalis, which is uh, the first book that I published back in 2006, mostly of poetry and short prose. Um, I'm going to read a short uh, poem from that in just a second. We have a novel called The Adventures of Layman Pang, based upon the life of a 7th century uh, Chan, that is Zen uh, uh, layman who uh, studied Buddhism. Now I'll be talking about Chan Buddhism soon. And this one, uh, this one I owe to the Carlisle Library because uh, many years ago I was here giving, I think it was four lectures on modern art. And at those lectures, uh, which were very well attended, uh, and there was a lot of enthusiasm, there was uh, a person who used to come up here all the way from Rhode Island. And after my second or third lecture, he came up to me and he said, you know, I used to teach art at RISD, the Rhode Island School of Design, and I'm really enjoying your art lectures. You should put them into a book. So I said, okay, if he says so, I'll do that. So this is called Modern Art in Context. It has a lot of full color photos, and it's basically those four lectures uh, condensed into four chapters. Um, if you are interested in getting any of them, there's two ways that you can do it. These three books, first of all, I'm going to donate today to the uh, Carlisle Library. I can't donate this one yet because this is my only copy right now, um, but maybe next time I'm here. Or you can, uh, they're available for purchase if you want to see me afterwards. As I said, I'm going to start off with a small poem from Chrysalis because it is a way of bridging from Hinduism that we talked about last time into the religions that we'll be talking about today. This poem is called Self-Portrait in Blue Ink. The squid emits a screen of ink. That is me. The ink lingers opaque in space, waves in place, as the squid escapes, that is me. As the waves break, rippling through the stained sea, deep blue in turquoise hues, that is me. Through which schools come and go, as darkness dissipates in the deep, 
translucent waves till no trace of a facing remains. That is me. From whence this inky screen? From the squid. From the sea. From me. Tat vam asi. So, in our last lecture, we talked about Hinduism. And one of the things that we mentioned about Hinduism is this substrate of Brahma, the divine uh, supreme deity from which all else, all other gods, all humans, all life, all inanimate objects, the entire universe emerges, if you will. And there's, by the way, lots of stories in Hinduism, I only had enough time to tell you only a few of them, about this emergence of the universe. One of the most beautiful stories, the, the question is asked, why does, why does everything emerge from Brahman? What, what gave rise to all of this? And the answer that is given is that Brahman became bored. And so Brahman tried to forget who Brahman was and thereby became all of these other things. And the path of life is to return to Brahman, to return intellectually, to remember who you are. Thou art that. You are the Supreme Deity. And this is a way of returning, is understanding this self-knowledge. Is Brahman returning to itself? And of course, as we mentioned, Hinduism is a cyclic religion. It believes in reincarnation. So once you remember that you're Brahman and you return to Brahman, well, eventually you're going to get bored again and you're going to have this other wonderful dream about not being Brahman again. So there's many different stories in Hinduism about this, but there is this fundamental principle, which is that Brahman undergirds everything else. Connected to that, and we talked about this in the last class, in the great text, the Bhagavad Gita, which is a text that is uh, almost universal throughout Hinduism. You know, there's lots of different Upanishads, but the Bhagavad Gita is one text that you can find as a common denominator across all of Hinduism. In that text, it speaks about karma and the notion that you need to do your duty. And this gets far more complex in the Gita uh, because, as I mentioned last time, ultimate insight, ultimate wisdom is realizing that you do your duty not for the benefit of future karma, but because it's the right thing to do. Uh, there's a great passage in the Gita that says that karma is like an upside down tree that grows from the heaven downward. And when I, again, when I read that, I thought, oh, this is so beautiful. This is such lovely imagery. And then it follows it up with, and what you need to do is take the axe of wisdom and hack it at its roots. <laughs> right? To get out of this cause and effect idea and to get into the notion of doing the thing for its own sake. Now, in Hinduism, the advice from Krishna to Arjuna, the king, is that you have your role to play, and now you must play it, like a player on the stage. And as we mentioned in the last lecture, there is throughout Hinduism both a vertical and a horizontal expectation. Vertically, it has to do with the caste system, the untouchables on the bottom, and then the uh, people who tend to the fields and do agriculture, and also the merchants just above the untouchables. And above them, the warrior caste. That would include kings like Arjuna. And then above them, the priestly caste, the Brahmins. And so you have a stratus that you are born into that determines what you are to do throughout your life. But there's also a horizontal uh, axis, 
which is time. And throughout your life, if you are born like Arjuna as a man into the warrior caste, there are certain roles you are expected to play. Student, and then householder, meaning getting married and having children and taking care of your worldly uh, endeavors. And then semi-retired, where you spend part of the time taking care of worldly endeavors and part of the time doing religious ritual in the woods. And then finally fully retired, where you give up on all of your worldly endeavors. You take a stance of detachment <coughs> and you spend all of your time in the woods doing religious rituals. So there's this vertical and horizontal expectation of what each person is supposed to do. Along comes Buddhism in India, and this is roughly about 500 BCE. And in the, the last time that I was here last year at the Carlisle Library, I gave a standalone lecture on Buddhism, during which time I told the whole story of the life of the Buddha and through that story, try to explain more about Buddhism. So I'm not going to tell you the life of the Buddha today. If you want to uh, see that, I think that the library has it on a DVD. Um, uh, what I'm going to tell you about today is about the relationship between Buddhism and Hinduism, and then the growth of Buddhism throughout Asia. Buddhism is a revolutionary religion in India. Because some of the things that the Buddha said go exactly contrary to Hinduism. So, for instance, one of the things is you don't have to wait till old age in order to do things that are spiritual. You can devote yourself to the life of spirituality at any age. You can become a monk. And not only that, but it doesn't matter what caste you come from. You can be an untouchable and be one of the Buddha's followers and even attain enlightenment is the message that the Buddha has to preach. In Hinduism, you have to go through many rebirths until you get reborn as a Brahmin before you have any possibility of enlightenment. And the Buddha says, no, it doesn't matter what age and it doesn't matter what caste. And furthermore, it doesn't matter your gender. Man or woman can be part of what's called the Sangha, the community of believers. So this is a very revolutionary message in terms of the social fabric of India. And there's another revolutionary message that it has. And one of the reasons why I'm so attracted to Buddhism is because it approaches head on all of the things that you would ever doubt. Right? So we talked last time about Brahman and my example to you about Brahman, the Brahman which is the supreme deity without any attributes or characteristics. I said, let's try to imagine something without any attributes or characteristics. Take this podium and remove from it any attributes or characteristics. That would include its height, its weight, its depth, its color, et cetera, et cetera. You keep on peeling it away. And I said, what are you left with? And somebody said, nothing. And I said, well, not quite nothing. You still have the name. You have the name Podium, right? You all remember that. Now, that doesn't help us very much. A supreme deity without any attributes or characteristics, somebody might come along and say, well, what if there's nothing? What if you just have a name and that name doesn't correspond to anything? What if there is no Brahman? And that's basically what Buddhism does. Somebody asked me just before we started this lecture, why do people have to believe in God? And that's exactly the approach that Buddha took and said, instead of being struck by a crisis of faith, oh my gosh, what if there is no God? Buddha says, eh, what if there is no God? Let's start with that. Let's begin there and see what we get. Remember, this is 500 BCE. And let me clarify something. A number of you may have seen uh, big statues or little statues of the Buddha. And you may have seen people bowing down to the Buddha or offering incense to the Buddha or offering 
uh, one of the things I love in my neighborhood, there's uh, a number of nail salons uh, that are owned by uh, people from either Korea or Thailand. Um, and in front of all of them in the morning when I walk to work, I see these statues of the Buddha that are about this big, and in front of them there's fruit, like an apple and an orange and things, and maybe a candle. And these are offerings. But let's be clear here. In Buddhism, the Buddha is not a god. In Buddhism, the Buddha is not a god. The Buddha is a historical person. His name was Siddhartha Gautama, and after he became enlightened, he gained the title of Buddha, which just means enlightened. And he says very clearly, I'm just a human being. Don't take my word for it, he says. He says, test it out for yourself. If it works, keep it. If it doesn't work, don't. I don't care. There's not a demand that you believe something. In fact, quite the opposite. There might be a, an invitation to believe nothing, which a lot of people find very unnerving, unsettling. But that's where Buddhism starts, with this premise. What if there is nothing? What if there's nothing to believe in? Uh-oh, I already have a question. Yes? According to Thich Nhat Hanh, yes. he says many people are, are misunderstand when, that Buddhism believes in nothing. There is something. There's nirvana. Nirvana goes in with what you said, the ultimate God or something, which you can't know, no words or no uh, compost. No compost. <laughs> <laughs> Could be that too. The construct, like in human construct, they can explain it. So, so you, go, you stay around till you improve yourself and you end up at nirvana, which is, you end up, as you pointed out, everybody's God. So he said, that he said that that's, not, that's not nothing. That's nirvana. We met last week, right? Huh? Excuse me? We met last week? Yes, sir. What's your name? Tom Duncan. Tom, Tom. Tom, when you go to the pool, you usually go in right into the deep end, don't you? You don't, you don't go from the stairs gradually getting, you just jump right in. We've been here 10 minutes, you're already getting to Nirvana. Give me, give me a second or two, we'll, we'll, a little bit at a time. We'll, we'll try to get there. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay, Tom, I appreciate it. Let's hold on to that, that Thich Nhat Hanh says that Buddhism doesn't believe in nothing, there's a double, double negative there, but rather that Buddhism believes in Nirvana. We'll get there, I promise you, Tom. So, Buddhism starts with this premise of what if there is no God? What if this Brahman that all of these Brahmins, the priests, are talking about is nothing? Where do we go from there? And the historical Buddha offers many different alternatives. And what he says is that we can take something very important from Hinduism and apply it to our lives. That major thing that we can take from Hinduism is this notion of Atman. And for the purposes of this lecture, I'm going to translate Atman as self, but it might be better for us 21st century Westerners to understand Atman as ego in the Freudian sense. The ego, the I, the me, the, the, the part of us that uh, is not only self, but selfish. The part that identifies with me, that I am me, that there is an identity here. And the Buddha suggests that what Hinduism does offer that's valuable is loosening up our attachment to this ego, to this notion of self, this Atman, this notion of I. And the Buddha starts with his first, uh, his first sermon. It's called the Deer Park Sermon because he gave it in a park for deer. And he says the four noble truths that one, we all suffer. 
Two, that we suffer because of our attachment. Three, this suffering can be alleviated. And four, we alleviate the suffering by following the Eightfold Noble Path. Now I'm going to go back over all those in more detail, but those are the four noble truths. Number one, we all suffer. What does suffering mean? Suffering means many different things to many different people. There is, of course, physical suffering, as in pain of the physical body. We all experience that at some time or another. There's also mental suffering, anguish, stress, all sorts of ways that we suffer mentally. And that is not to be diminished. And even one of the great lines from Tolstoy that I love is he says that the, uh, the wealthy landowner suffers as much as the pauper when he sees that one of his roses is not blossoming like all the others. <laughs> right? In other words, there is no metric to suffering. Right? For a long time, you know, I would, I would try to belittle my own suffering. I'd say, you know, it's, it's not like I'm living through the Holocaust or something like that. You know, my suffering compared to the suffering of others is really something trivial. But to make these comparisons doesn't really hold up, because suffering is suffering. We all suffer in one way or another, because we're all human. And the reason for this suffering according to the Buddha, is not only because we're all human, but because as humans we have attachments. The wealthy landowner might be attached to that one rose that's not blossoming. Right? But you might be attached to your children, or your parents, your siblings, your neighbors. And to see them suffer causes you pain and suffering. I heard on the radio yesterday a, a, a mother who's um, daughter had become addicted to opiates. And she said something that I, I found very profound. She said, a mother can only be as happy as her least happy child. Right? So we have these attachments to all sorts of things. Now the, the, the rose one might you know, strike you as a little bit trivial, but right, think about you get a new car, and then you drive it into Boston, and you park, and then you come out, and then suddenly there's a ding on the end of it, or a scratch down the middle of it, and suddenly you're suffering, right? right? And so we, we have these attachments. But I think that the Buddha was more psychologically uh, subtle than this, because what he understood was that all of those attachments that cause us suffering are related to one major attachment. And that major attachment is our attachment to our own ego, to the self, to me. Because I care, first and foremost, and most powerfully, about me, I suffer because of all of these other things. And our attachment to ourselves is what causes the most pain, the most suffering. And the Buddha understood from Hinduism that if we take Hinduism seriously, it's, at its central tenet, that you are not the you that you think about in the mirror, but you're greater than you, we begin to loosen up that attachment to ego. But instead of Atman Brahman, as in Hinduism, the self is the supreme deity, Buddha's insight is that Atman Sunyata. Sunyata means emptiness. Emptiness. Another way of putting it is there is no fixed abiding self. There is no fixed abiding self that 
The self, the notion of me, I, ego, this is an illusion. It's part of maya. But instead of in Hinduism, that illusion giving way to the reality, which is Brahman, the supreme deity, in Buddhism, that illusion gives way to nothing. Nothing. There is no fixed self, no abiding selfhood. Now, there's many different ways that we could think about this and to understand it. One way is, think about who you were ten years ago. Are you the same person? Think about who you were forty years ago. Are you the same person? For some of you, think about who you were eighty years ago. Are you the same person? Now, in biology, we're just learning now that every seven years, every single cell in the human body gets replaced. So even on a molecular level, we're not the same. There's no fixed abiding self. But on a level of uh, mental complexity, on a level of emotion, on many different levels, there's not an abiding self. Rather, there is a self that is understood relationally. And in Buddhism, there's what they call two truths. There is contingent truth or dependent truth, and there is absolute truth. And we're going to get to those two in a moment. But to understand it better, I need a victim. Volunteer. Sorry, I mixed those up. I need one, one volunteer. Anybody, anybody. Right here, we have a, a volunteer right here. You want to come on up so you can be on the camera? <laughs> come on over here. Say hello to everybody at home. There we go. What's your name? Mary. Mary, I'm Jason. Have we practiced this before? No. No, never, right? We didn't rehearse this? No, no. Okay, good. I just want to make sure everybody knows this. Um, so, Mary, I'm going to ask you one simple question I just want you to answer honestly. Okay? Who are you? Mary. I didn't ask your name. Try again. Oh. <laughs> Shouldn't I go off camera? No, 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 no. Come on over here, Mary. Tell everybody in our studio audience who you are. This is a trick question. <laughs> I'm a magician. Didn't you see my magic trick last week? I'm full of tricks. So, I'm not Mary. You're not Mary. I'm not. No, 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 no. Not who you're not, who you are. We need a positive statement. But everything I say, you're going to say, no, you're not. Try one. I am a Carlisle resident. Okay, I didn't ask where you live. Try again. You're doing great, though. You're doing great. I am female. I didn't ask your gender. Do you, want, do you want to take some suggestions from the audience? Sure. Anybody have a suggestion for Mary? Nothing. Me. Nothing. <laughs> we, have a, we have a lot of suggestions about who you are. Now, Mary, presumably you've had... Feeling stupid. Oh, I'm sorry, Mary. Um, but I, but I, I also didn't ask about how you're feeling. Um, <laughs> but presumably you've had some time to think about this question. Yes? Yeah, I'm not coming up with any acceptable answers. Okay. Well, everybody give her a hand. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mary. Good try. So, when we ask the question of ourselves or somebody else, who are you? Often people will answer as Mary did, maybe with their name, maybe with their position in the family, right? I'm a mother, I'm a father, I'm a son, whatever. Maybe with their occupation, right? Maybe with where they live, maybe with how old they are. But none of these answers are the answer to the question, who are you? And when we answer the question in any of those other ways, what we're answering is our relationship to other things, right? But we're not answering essentially who we are. And this is exactly what Buddhism means 
by dependent arising or dependent truth or relative truth. It's always relational. So I could tell you perhaps what a chair is, right? I could give you a definition of a chair. It's a legged object that people sit in, in. But in order to do that, we would have to know what legs are. We'd have to know what people are. We'd have to know what sitting is. So all of these things are relational to other things. And nothing is itself in itself, alone, in isolation. And so there is this notion of dependent relative truth. Right? On a dependent relative level, Mary is who she says she is, a resident of Carlisle. A uh, 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 female, as she said, right? But in an absolute sense, she, no offense, is nothing. <laughs> but so are you <laughs> and me, okay? Nothing, emptiness. When we try to get to that, that essence, we find nothing there. Now this nothing is what, what Hinduism called Brahman. Right? Now, Buddha is just saying, yeah, forget about Brahman. You create all this wild theology with Brahman. But really, it's just nothing. Let's start there. There's nothing. But it's important that we have this double truth, the absolute truth of emptiness and the contingent, dependent, relative truth because we are all connected, right? We cannot stand alone. We, the person that you see in front of you, Jason Gennetti, is only who he is in relation to you and you and the entire world, right? So, you know, there's this old, uh, old joke, a Zen Buddhist walks into Burger King and says, make me one with everything. Right? We're, we're already one with everything. Right? We're already connected. Because if we weren't already connected, if we didn't have this interdependence, we wouldn't exist as we know ourselves in this phenomenal way. Right? As the, what, what Buddhism would call maya, as, as illusory selves. That's not this, there's not a value judgment on that. That's just a statement, maya as illusion. But absolutely, we can't say who we are. It's ineffable, beyond words. And so Buddha starts with this notion of emptiness, which goes against the Hindu idea of Brahman as the substrate for everything. Buddha says, eh, we don't need the substrate. We just start with nothing. So good or evil would fall into that same category as tall or short? Good and evil, tall and short, all of those are relative terms. There wouldn't be absolute <coughs> good, absolute evil. Yes, they're relative. Thank you for the segue, because now you bring me to where we're going. <laughs> Hint, uh, Buddhism, which starts in India, northern India, by the Himalayas, doesn't take root there. It doesn't flourish. But eventually, it gets over the Himalayas and into Asia. And in Asia, it meets up with the indigenous, I don't know if we want to call it a religion or a philosophy, of Taoism. Taoism also started roughly around 400 or 500 BCE in China by the scholar, the mystic Lao Tzu who wrote the famous Tao Te Ching. And the Tao Te Ching has many overlapping similarities with Buddhism. I'm going to have to pause there for a minute, because I remembered in the, the Four Noble Truths, I only got to two. You, you, you helped me advance, but I need to retreat now for a second. Back to the Four Noble Truths. I do want to make sure I get through all four. Yeah. Number one. We all suffer. We suffer in many different ways. Number two, we suffer because of our attachment to ego, an illusory thing that we, uh, 
we connect so closely with that it causes us pain and suffering. Number three, this suffering can be alleviated. And number four, the suffering is alleviated through the Eightfold Noble Path. Now let's come back to number three and four. All four of these noble truths that the Buddha proclaims are in the same format as in ancient India, the way that doctors would uh, diagnose a patient. You start off with the diagnosis, and here it is suffering. You next give the cause of the diagnosis. Here it is attachment. You next give the prognosis. Can it be healed or not? Here it is, yes, can be healed. And then, lastly, you give the prescription. And here it is the Eightfold Noble Path. I'm not going to get into the Eightfold Noble Path, because basically what the Eightfold Noble Path helps you to do is to loosen up your attachment with ego. By following the Eightfold Noble Path, which you can conveniently read about in this book, you, um, you are loosening up your attachment to ego. Now that I talked about that, check, we can now get back into China where Buddhism begins to make some inroads, meets up with Taoism, also from roughly the same time period. Taoism starts off, the first saying of the Tao Te Ching is, the true eternal Tao cannot be spoken. The Tao that can be spoken is not the true eternal Tao. And then there's a, another passage that says, one leads to two, two leads to three, and three leads to the 10,000 things. Now, that might sound like bad math, but I'm going to try to explain it. First of all, Tao, it's usually spelled T-O-A, and pronounced like, you know, the stock market, Dao, with a D, D-O-W. Oh. The Dao, in Chinese, literally means way. Way. Like when you walk along your way. And Lao Tzu says, the Dao that can be spoken is not the true eternal Dao. Now, in Taoism, this notion of Dao, or way, takes on what we might call something like a metaphysical uh, uh, meaning. It's, it's unspeakable. But we have this word, Tao, that we do speak. The unspeakable Tao, the true eternal Tao, and the word, Tao, that we do speak, that makes two. The unspeakable is one, the speakable, two, and those two work together. And that makes three. And from those three come everything. The 10,000 things, that stands for everything in the universe. So there is the unspeakable, unknowable Tao. And then there's the Tao that can be spoken. There is this Tao that can be spoken, what linguists would call, is a signifier. What it signifies cannot be spoken. But these two are together. Now, if you are familiar with the yin-yang um, image of Taoism, the one dark wave going into the white wave, the dark wave, which is known as yin, is the unspeakable, that which never comes into knowing. The yang, the white wave, the illuminated wave, is the part that is speakable. And those two together form this circle. And that, from that circle comes all things. So according to Taoism, everything is made up of that which is hidden and that which is known. What much later European German philosopher Immanuel Kant would call the noumenal, the part that we cannot know as human beings, and the phenomenal, the part that we do know, that we can know. So according to Taoism, there's these two parts. And in Taoism, The central approach, there is no, there's no talk of God, there's no talk of religion or ritual. 
it seems to be very closely aligned with nature. And the central approach is to follow the path or the way of nature. And we are given numerous examples of how nature works. And that part that is hidden, the yin, is often associated with things that are weak in nature. And the yang, the part that is seen, is often affiliated with things that are strong in nature. So to give you an example from the Tao Te Ching, think about a river with a boulder in it. The water is soft, like the yin. The boulder hard, like the yang. When the water meets the boulder, what does it do? Goes around it. Just goes around it. Or if the boulder is big enough, eventually over time, it wears it down. Right? And so the notion is, be like the water. Be soft, supple. That which is hard and unyielding, what we might call in personality terms, stubborn. Right? That which is hard and unyielding is like a dead branch on a tree. When a wind blows, it breaks. But that which is supple and yielding, things that we might think of as weaknesses, that doesn't break. That bends. And throughout the Tao Te Ching, there is this supple, supple uh, uh, imagery. And the message seems to be to align yourself with that which is supple in nature. But you don't do it in a very aggressive way. Right? You don't do it in a very positive way. In fact, the way to the Tao, which means way, in the Tao Te Ching is what's called in Chinese Wei Wu Wei. The way to the way is Wei Wu Wei. And Wei Wu Wei literally means Doing, not doing. Doing, not doing. Actively, not doing. That's different from laziness. Right? When I tell my son to do his homework, he's not doing it. That's different from actively not doing. Right? If he was sitting in the lotus position meditating, then I would say, okay, he's doing, not doing. But when he's just sitting on the couch playing Fortnite, that's just not doing. You see the difference? So in, in Taoism, there's a notion of doing not doing, actively not doing. And by the way, in China, this goes against the grain of the dominant, what we might call religion or culture, which is Confucianism. Confucius and Lao Tzu lived roughly about the same time. Confucius, who's known for his book, The Analects, was very much about principle and being very strong and sticking to your guns and following the ancient traditions and making sure that you respect your elders. And there is definitely a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. And Lao Tzu comes along and says, eh. <laughs> In other words, for, for Confucius, the way up the mountain is one way. Right? There is de a definitive way up the mountain. And Lao Tzu comes along and says, don't confuse this or that path up the mountain for the mountain. There are many ways up the mountain. And if you say any one of them is the way, you already got the wrong way. Right? <laughs> Buddhism comes into China and meets with Taoism, and after a period of some friction, because they're so closely aligned, they realize that they have more in common than different. And Buddhism and Taoism begin to merge, both of them as this uh, uh, counterculture approach, at least in the beginning, to the dominant Confucianism. So in China, the most uh, lauded and honorable thing that you could aspire to do. It's not to be a doctor or a lawyer, it's to be a public servant. 
to be part of the government. And in order to become part of the government, there were rigorous tests that you had to take. And those tests were on Confucianism. And they were not easy. And this might be an overstatement, but my sense is everybody who either dropped out or saw through the facade of all of this public honor, they became Taoists. And then eventually Taoist Buddhists. There was a, a, a merging of the two. And then eventually Taoism and Buddhism became the dominant, I won't say Taoism, but the, the Taoism that was incorporated into Buddhism became the dominant religion in China. What did Buddhism do once it became dominant? It had nothing to rebel against. And my theory is, in the 6th century or so, that's when Buddhism, realizing that it's the dominant religion in China, without anything to rebel against, decided to rebel against itself. And what did that create? That created Chan Buddhism. Chan, which uh, Chan is the Chinese translation of an older uh, Sanskrit word that simply means meditation, seated meditation. Chan, when it goes to Japan, will be translated into the word Zen. Zen Buddhism simply means seated meditation Buddhism. Around the 6th and 7th centuries in China, we see the emergence of Chan Buddhism. And Chan has a very, very irreverent attitude towards everything, including Buddhism. So, for instance, one of the very popular Chan sayings from China is, if you see the Buddha, kill the Buddha. If you see the Buddha, kill the Buddha. In other words, getting back to the origins of what the Buddha taught, you don't have to believe me. Right? Try it out for yourself. If it works, great. If not, eh. So if you see the Buddha, kill the Buddha, means don't set up for yourself some sort of idol, some sort of ideal. Live your own authentic life. And Chan Buddhism becomes this iconoclastic, sort of idiosyncratic uh, offshoot of the mainstream Buddhism that's in China. And there's lots of wonderfully um, uh, colorful stories that come down to us. For instance, it's said that the uh, Buddhist patriarch that brought Chan from India into China is known as Bodhidharma. And Bodhidharma came into China and he found a cave and he sat in front of that cave for seven years meditating. Well, if you've ever tried meditating, you might discover that you tend to doze off. Right? And so the story goes that in order to prevent dozing off, Bodhidharma cut off his eyelids and he threw them on the ground and where his eyelashes landed, there grew up tea plants. And so tea, which has caffeine in it, by the way, tea has become associated with Chan or Zen Buddhism, right? Because it helps keep you awake. <laughs> it's also told about Bodhidharma that he was sitting there in front of the wall of his cave and there was somebody who wanted to become his disciple. And he kept on saying, hey, Bodhidharma, I want to be your disciple. And Bodhidharma paid no attention to him. He was meditating. And this went on for a long time until finally the disciple got so frustrated with Bodhidharma not listening to him that he hacked off his own arm. And Bodhidharma turned around and said, OK, I'm ready for you. <laughs> There are a lot of very colorful, very strange stories from the, tra the Chan tradition uh, of Buddhism. One of my favorite is a story about uh, the first Chan female monk. And it says that for many years she strived for enlightenment. Now, in Buddhism, the symbol, or one of the symbols for enlightenment, for nirvana, is the full moon. 
And it says that she strived for enlightenment for a long, long time. Uh, until one night, she's carrying water in a bamboo bucket. And the moon, which reflects in the water uh, as she's walking, suddenly the bamboo bucket, the uh, straps that were holding it together give way and the bottom falls out and all the water falls out of the bucket and suddenly she's enlightened. What could that mean? What could that mean? The moon, symbol of enlightenment, is reflected in the water. We are the water, right? Uh, as Dogen, who's a, uh, another uh, Japanese Zen practitioner, we'll get to him in a moment, says, the moon in a dewdrop, right? There might be many, many different dewdrops, but the moon is not affected by any of them. Similarly, it doesn't matter how big the dewdrop, it could be as large as the ocean or as small as one little dewdrop on a blade of grass, the entire moon is in it. Right? So this notion of the moon being reflected in the dewdrop is the idea that there might be enlightenment, but it can fill you up and it's never depleted. Right? The moon reflected in the pail of water, suddenly the bottom gives out and the, all the water is gone. No self in which the enlightenment can take place. This is the symbol that leads her to understand enlightenment. Or there's another great story about, uh, about this. This comes from the wider uh, Buddhist tradition and it says that the Buddha had his right-hand man. And this right-hand man was not so very uh, swift on the uptake, like I just said. <laughs> and the Buddha it felt bad for him because for many years he was trying to understand nirvana, trying to understand enlightenment. And so the Buddha gives him a magic cloth and he says, Ananda, that's the, the name of the right-hand man. Ananda, take this cloth and bring it to the river and wash it clean. The magic cloth was already white. Ananda goes to the river, he washes it, pulls it out. It's more dirty than it was before. He goes to the river, he washes it again. It's more dirty than it was before. He keeps on doing this. Every time he washes it, it gets more and more soiled. Finally, he comes back weeping to the Buddha. And he says, Master, I have tried, I have tried as hard as I can to get your cloth clean, but every time I wash it, it gets more dirty. And the Buddha looks at him and says, is there something to be learned from this? And suddenly Ananda is enlightened. In other words, striving for enlightenment is going to get you further from it. And you can see how this matches up very nicely with the Taoist idea of Wei Wu Wei doing, not doing. Think about the structure of striving for enlightenment. Tom, you listening? Yes, sir. Okay. I disagree with something. Okay. <laughs> Think about the structure. I want to be enlightened. Why? Because that will make me happy. Okay? I'm going to try really hard. I'm going to strive. I'm going to do it. I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps and I'm going to become enlightened. All of that's about me. It's all ego. It's all striving for me. And so in Buddhism and particularly in Chan or Zen, there's the notion of give up on enlightenment. Screw it. Or as the, the, the Zen or Chan masters say, there's a question and answer. Master, what is nirvana? The answer, nirvana is everyday mind. Or there's another, uh, <laughs> there's another saying that I can't, I can't uh, tell it the way that it's written in the book because of the, the young ones at home watching. But <laughs> the student says, Master, what is enlightenment? And the master says, enlightenment is the poo and the piss. Right? In other words, there's nothing special about it. Enlightenment is everyday mind. The, the notion of nirvana is not something special. As long as you have nirvana, which means enlightenment, you're going to have samsara, 
which is the non-enlightened uh, experience of the world. And that's a dualistic experience of the world. Nirvana, good. Samsara, bad. And so what Buddhism gets at is there's not this dualism. The dualism is part of that dependent arising, the dependent relative truth. Relative truth sees true and false, good and bad, nirvana, samsara. But the experience of nirvana is to undo all of these dualisms. So if we undo these dualisms, then there's no difference between nirvana and samsara. Let me give you a parable to help explain this or illustrate this. The Buddha tells a great story about a person who is on a shore. And on that shore, there are lions and tigers and bears, all sorts of dangers. Right? And he looks across the river and he sees on the other shore, it's calm, tranquil, peaceful, no threats. No lions, no tigers, no bears. He says, oh my, I want to get over there. And so what does he do? He constructs a raft. And he gets on the raft, and he goes across the water, and he gets to the other side. Now the Buddha asks, when he gets to the other side, what does he do with the raft? Does he put it on his head and carry it around? <laughs> no. Now, let me try to unpack what this parable is talking about. The side with the lions and tigers and bears, that's samsara. That's our experience of the world. Our lives are in danger all the time. We might die. In fact, we will die. We're all mortal. That's scary. Nirvana holds out this promise of getting out of all of that. And that's the far shore. That's the nether shore. And the, the raft in this parable is Buddhism. The raft is Buddhism. We get on the raft, we take the raft to the nether shore. And the Buddha says, once you get to the other shore, do you carry the raft on your head? No. In other words, once you get enlightened, once you get to nirvana, you don't need Buddhism anymore. Who cares? Get rid of it. It's just a hindrance now. It was just uh, the proverbial ladder. Once you get to the top of the ladder, you kick it away. But still, that parable has a dualism to it has the dangerous shore and the tranquil shore. And so the Zen master says, well, actually, there is no shore and there is no raft. All there is is the water. All there is is the water. And what we need to do, what, what nirvana is, is just learning to swim, to swim in the water. It takes away any security any notion of comfort. There's just here and now. Right? The Dalai Lama says that on the calendar, there's only two days, only two days, that you can't do anything about your situation or about your karma. You know which two days? Tomorrow and yesterday. Tomorrow and yesterday, exactly. There's just today, right? Buddhism is about being present in the here and now, right? If we think about heaven as eternity, right? Another way of saying that is a series of nows. Now, now, now. There is no past. There is no future. There is now. Where does the past happen? Now. Where do we contemplate the future? Now. It's all now. There's only now. And if you are in the now, then you can be present for those people with you. You're not busy thinking about where I'm going to go to lunch or what I did this morning, you are there for the person that's right in front of you. And that matters to Buddhism. Because, yeah, there is emptiness, but there is also relative truth. Our determined, our uh, 
uh, interdependent existence with other people. Right? So Buddhism has this dual way of seeing that requires both a detachment from our strong connection with our egos, but not in order to be detached from life and from other people and, as Buddhism would say, other sentient beings, but in order to be there present for them, with them. And so one of the central tenets of Buddhism is compassion. And if we think about the Latin root of that, passion means to suffer. The CO or COM in front of it means together, to suffer with. And so Buddhism isn't really about getting rid of suffering. It's about being able to suffer with others that are suffering. And so in Buddhism, whether it be Zen uh, or other branches of what's called the Mahayana Buddhism, which is the, the so-called greater vehicle Buddhism, there's this notion of the, uh, the uh, saint, if you will, the arhat. <coughs> And the notion is that uh, the saint is one who could enter into nirvana, but chooses not to, and takes a vow, and says, I will not enter into nirvana until all other sentient beings have entered first. Sentient beings. That doesn't mean human beings. That means ants and worms, cows, chickens, right? So in Buddhism, there's already a notion of <coughs> ethics that applies beyond the human sphere. It's not anthrocentric or anthropocentric. It is a, an ethics that is environmental. And so the saint in Buddhism says, I will not enter into nirvana until every other sentient being has entered first. And makes you wonder, like, what if that were to happen and then, you know, there this saint is and there's one other saint there. You first. Oh, no, you. Oh, no, you. I insist. It creates a little problem. But you get the idea that there's this notion of being with others. The, the idea isn't a, an egocentric, selfish notion of I'm going to get myself out of suffering. Goodbye. It's... I'm here to be with you and to be fully present with you. There's lots more to be said about this, but I want to take some time for questions. I'm happy to answer Tom's question first, but if any of you have questions, I'm happy to answer those questions. Why don't you think uh, Buddhism or Zen Buddhism ever captured in, the United, in Western uh, society? The question is, why don't I think that Buddhism or Zen Buddhism never caught on in Western society? I think it has. I mean, in um, you know, one of the uh, byproducts, uh, one could argue, one of the byproducts of war is exchange of ideas. And after World War II, where a lot of GIs were, were in the South Pacific and uh, in Japan, it's interesting, in the 50s, there was this huge rise of interest in Japanese culture and Japanese religion and in the 50s, you had the beat poets who were you know, proclaiming the Dharma. And you had Alan Watts, who had his own television show, which is amazing. Uh, and, you know, and he would just go out and sit in the lotus position, which is amazing to think that people would actually watch that. Um, and so the, the, you know, Buddhism and, uh, and Zen have taken, you know, been taken by storm by the West, so much so that, you know, Zen and, and Nirvana are common words. I mean, there's even bands that take you know, these names. So I think that it, it might not have become a dominant religion. Right. Um, I think that there's centuries, millennia of tradition that you know, stand in the way of that. But I think that a lot, a lot of people are at least um, inclined to learn about it. Look at you. You're all here. Right. Other questions? Tom, did I answer your question? Yes and no. Okay, I love it. A Taoist answer. I, I, I do like it. But he, he didn't take me along. I don't want to go into the, <laughs> the grounding of everything. As Buddhism, I, mostly through Thich Nhat Hanh, I, I read mostly. 
Okay. But according to him, we have the, also the horizontal and the vertical. The physical world that we see is the horizontal. Mm -hmm. The vertical is the God line. And nobody can understand the God line. We'd have no words for it, no human construct to describe it. But everybody is grounded at the God line. And we are in our efforts to get ourselves mentally, like you said, develop the, uh, the ultimate truth of courtesy and love. And, and, and as we do, spend our time on this ground plane. If you don't get the ground plane, you'll never get the God plane. Okay. And, and from my, my, there might be different Buddhism, I don't know. But from my understanding, like what ticked on it, there's no such thing as nothing. Nothing can create nothing. But what happens is we transform. The water that you spill out of your cup gets transformed. It doesn't go to nothing. It goes to the ground, it wets the ground, things grow from it. There's no such thing as nothing, but there's a lot of transformation that takes place. When we, like you said before, I, I like your idea with the Hinduism, the, the, the clothes we wear. Clearly, my, my clothes, meaning your body, is different than that when it was a child. And it's different now that I'm 84. And it's going to be different when I die. But I'll be dust and I'll be doing something, energy, and other plants, other things will grow. I will not, this, this, this me physically will disappear. It, it's, but in general, it's noise compared to everything else you said. I, I really like what, the, really, the philosophy. Thank you, Tom. The way, the way I see it, Tom, is that if you and I disagree, we disagree about nothing, and therefore we don't really disagree. <laughs> That's what I'm arguing. That's the problem I have with Hinduism. In his, in Hinduism, it says, we have the God of war and the God of peace. The God of peace says he looks out and sees the fathers, sons, babies being born. He looks at the other ones and says, fathers, sons, what gives me the right to kill these? I'll, I'll have war. And the God of war says, don't be a sissy. Right away, I got a problem. He makes a distinction between men and women. Yes. That's not very godlike. It's not. I agree. And the next thing he says, kill them because you know they're going to change their garment. That may be true, but the, our garment has a very interesting thing, like different from cloth. It wants to stay alive and it heals itself. Mm -hmm. So I got a real, I, I think a lot of the religions have a lot of uh, man uh, constructs, human constructs. And what we, and everything I say is my own human construct. Uh, so, and, and what, but what bothers me is if there's Hindus running around preaching the God of war, it gives me pain. I hear you, Tom. I hear you. Any other questions? But I'd like to point out the connection between all the religions, philosophies, whatever you call it. There is this search and trying to understand what makes life actually work. Ah, so the, the comment was that through all these religions, there's this surge in this attempt at understanding what makes life actually work. But I would, I would change that just a little bit. In all these religions, and, and maybe I'll come back another time to redo my Principles of World Religions course, but in all these religions, there is a striving for meaning, a striving to understand. And here's where I'd put a little difference about Buddhism, and particularly Zen Buddhism. In a lot of religions, that understanding is posited in some sort of transcendental, right? God. God makes us understand ourselves vis-a-vis -vis God. We, in Buddhism, it says there's nothing, right? And that the meaning that you make is the meaning that you make. There is no objective meaning to life. Life is what you make it to mean. 
And that's just what we're always doing. And Buddhism or Zen Buddhism draws attention to that. And uh, there's a great little story about a teacher and a student, a little different than uh, uh, Bodhidharma that I told before. This, this teacher is a little bit more compassionate. The student comes up to the teacher and says, teacher, I want to learn about Buddhism from you. And the teacher says, OK, see that tree outside? And the student says, yes. And the teacher says, look at that tree. And when you can tell me what it means, I'll teach you. And the student sits there and looks at the tree day in, day out, day in. Day. Finally, after you know, a few weeks have gone by, he comes into the teacher and says, I've been looking at that damn tree for weeks now. And it means nothing. And the teacher says, OK, I'm ready for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes? It's, it occurs to me that the way Buddha looked at himself might have been the way Jesus looked at himself. Would you comment on that? OK, the, the comment is, uh, it occurs to him the way that Buddha looked at himself might have been the way that Jesus looked at himself. Might have been. That, that, that might be true. Um, there's a few things, at least in the canonical Gospels, right? In the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that um, suggest a difference. And mainly the passage where Jesus says, store not for yourselves clothing and riches that moths can destroy and thieves can steal. But rather, says Jesus, store up for yourselves your riches in heaven where moths cannot destroy and thieves cannot steal. Now, if Jesus stopped at the first part of that saying, I'd say that's <coughs> Buddhism. But when he goes on to talk about heaven as sort of this like great bank in the sky, that's where I think, you know, it's just saying, you know, when you die, the you that you know is going to be up there and you're going to have this savings account that's going to be great. And that sounds like ego, right? Sounds like ego to me. Buddha's saying, forget about that. Forget about all that, right? Live here, live now. Now, I said the canonical gospels for a reason. If we look at the gospel of Thomas, that is not part of the canonical gospels, was not included in the tradition, in the Gospel of Thomas, uh, first of all, Jesus has a sense of humor, which I really love. So the disciples come up to him and say, where's heaven? And Jesus says, well, if it was in the sky, then the birds would get there first. That can't be right. And he says, if it, it was in the, in the ocean, then the fish would get there first. <laughs> that can't be right. And you see him just having fun with them. And then finally he says, the kingdom is all around you, but people see it not. In other words, nirvana is here and now. That would be Buddhism. By the way, a little side note, Thomas, who wrote the Gospel of Thomas, is also known as Deuterothomas, meaning Thomas the twin. And scholars think that might suggest the twin brother to Jesus. Interesting. Even more interesting, he said after Jesus died, to have gone down to India to preach the Gospels. And that's where he was put in jail and died. Be uh, but before that, he wrote the Gospel of Thomas. And one other thing that I'd recommend to all of you, the Hymn of the Pearl. The Hymn of the Pearl. Read that, then we'll talk next year. Yes? If I am nothing, and... <laughs> No, you're married. The universe, don't confuse me. And the universe around me is nothing. Why should I get out of bed in the morning? And if I do get out of bed in the morning, why should I be good? And if I'm good, define good. <laughs> Mary, that's lovely. I love it. That is the starting point of Buddhism, right? Buddhism starts where melancholy is at its lowest, right? You know, it's all meaningless. I'm nothing. Nothing matters. What difference does it make? And Buddhism says, okay, yeah. Deal with that for a while. And what Buddhism suggests is 
The meaning that it makes is the meaning that you attach to it. But we're not supposed to do attachments. <laughs> <laughs> not supposed to. Not supposed to. Uh, the way, here's the way I would put it, okay? In this world of uh, interconnectedness, right, in the, the dependent arising, the dependent truth world, right, um, meaning is constructed. And the word for that in Buddhism is maya, meaning illusion. Illusion, okay? Let me tell you a little story, not from the Buddhist tradition, from the Jason tradition, <laughs> to give you some frame of reference for why you get up in the morning. When my son was little, he was about, I don't know, three or four or something, we went to the beach one day and he met one of his other friends there. And the whole day at the beach, I'm sitting there reading my book about Buddhism, you know, and he and his friend are on the beach and they are moving these stones all around the beach and they're calling them trophies and this and that and other thing and you know th these trophies matter so much to them and then you know a little bit later they go into the water and they play and then they come out and then uh, my son's friend his mother says okay Nick or whatever it was you know it's time to go home um, but you can't leave your trophies lying around. You know, somebody might tri trip on them. You need to put your trophies away. And Nick says, what? What are you talking about? And his mom says, you know, you gotta take your trophies and put them away. And Nick says, trophies? And she says, yeah, those stones. He says, oh, the stones, <laughs> right? So in other words, in our mind, in our imagination, these Stones can be trophies, and they matter a lot. But when the game is up, they're back to stones again. They're just stones, right? You know, uh, same, you know in an anthropology class once, uh, I heard it said, you know, uh, in many different cultures, different cultures have different things of value. And so in some cultures, it might be a particular stick and in other cultures it might be a particular rock, and in other cultures it might be a particular piece of paper, right? And then eventually you begin to think, oh, in our culture, like, you know, a hundred dollar bill, it's just a piece of paper. But where does that value come from? We attach the value to it. We're not even on the gold system anymore, right? There's no gold somewhere that gives that dollar value. It's all because of our interrelations and our making meaning of it, and our creating this illusion that it's worth something. How can I go to a store and get bread that somebody worked for, and put effort into, and raw materials into, and give them this lousy piece of paper, and get that back? It's only because we all buy into the same illusion, right? And those illusions now are just computer numbers. But it means a lot to us, right? When we see these numbers going down and down and down and down, right? our heart starts palpitating. But it's just a game. And we're in that game. And we bought into that game. And maybe that game's fun, or maybe it's scary. But we're all in it, right? And maybe you want to get out of it. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Speaking of the game, um, I read a book years ago that stopped me in my tracks. It was written by a man named B.F. Skinner. Mm -hmm. uh, and the title of the book was Beyond Freedom and Dignity. And the premise was, you don't, you're not free because you're totally driven by what other people think of you. And your actions are driven by what others think of you. And you're, you have no dignity because the only reason you do good is because you want others to think well of you. And you're totally driven by that thought. And it's, it's this notion of science, if that's a science, um, standing in the way of further under, better understanding. Yeah. Well, I mean, in Buddhism, I think that Buddhism tries to coach us even beyond being concerned about what others think about us that it tries to coach us into 
recognizing that whatever dignity and freedom we have, it's all created by us. And there's a great little parable about this. It says that there's two monks and they're looking at the flag and the flag is blowing, flapping around. And one monk says to the other one, the flag is making the air move. And the other one says, no, 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 no. The air is making the flag move. And then their teacher comes over and hears the discussion and says, mind makes flag and air move. <laughs> yes? Back to the Confucian era in China, mm -hmm. was there any effort on the part of the authorities to wipe out these revolutionary religions? Yes, there was persecution of Buddhism and Taoism by Confucianism um, at different time periods, depending on who was in power and uh, what their, their approach was. Buddhism really took off after a king named Ashoka had a brutal, brutal uh, uh, war that devastated you know, thousands upon thousands of people. And then after he conquered all these lands, then he adopted Buddhism. <laughs> and he, he paid for all these temples to be built and all, the, all, all you know, these priests to be uh, sponsored and so forth. And so that's when Buddhism really became sort of the official religion of China. Everybody, I thank you so much for indulging in all the questions and answers, and I thank you for the time here. And I look forward to seeing you next year. I think we'll have another two lectures next year. Okay.